<laughs> I'm here before Bob is. Where's uh, Bob? I do not see him showing up as of yet, but. Uh huh. Uh huh. I take it that's just like him. I was going to say, well, it's certainly given me the first five minutes of any discourse. <laughs> that's all I can say. So, Bob. <laughs> appreciate you guys being willing to do this. Well, so far, it's only me. Well, I appreciate Save you. Save your me. gratitude for Bob until he actually Please shows Bob. up. <laughs> How are you doing? Where are you? I am at uh, The Muse. It's a uh, writer center here in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. Yes. I do an occasional class here called uh, The Art of the Interview. And oh, cool. uh, my daughter enjoys taking their writer's camp uh, during the summer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. I guess it's in the DNA. <laughs> it's all I can figure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't have kids. I decided <laughs> that I didn't want to pass my D. I didn't want to risk anything. Like, I ain't passing my DNA on. Well, I can assure you my office looks exactly like yours, so you haven't missed out on that aspect anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my first wife would meet me at the top of the stairs when I try and sneak books into the house with their arms crossed. This shall <laughs> not pass. My second wife is, unfortunately, either weaker-willed or, or easily gulled or I don't know. It's a sickness. Uh, should I text Bob? Uh, yeah, I guess so. He wrote back and said that he was in, but he's not here. So maybe he's struggling with the Zoom link or forgotten where it is. I'm here and you're not. I'm here and you're not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking trash about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hope that was all talk to text. It was, but of course, the spell check is not actually... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, for the record, you are spelling that N Y A H. Exactly. Okay, just checking. And another thing about Bob. Uh oh, wait a second. Even better. It's the best I could have hoped for. Oh, there you <laughs> <laughs> all right sorry about that guys as i told you you're not in my contacts will so i have to hunt for everything you've ever sent me to find your zoom link i understand well i appreciate you, you finding when it. you guys interview ancient retiree actors like john and myself you may wish to resend the link 10 minutes prior to the interview i just put everybody in my contact list as soon as they <laughs> hey, the bug guy the air conditioner guy you name it <laughs> All right, how's the light? Is there enough light here on me or not? Yeah, that's great. All right, because I I'm at a friend's house while I'm working here. And you in got LA. all and you got all cleaned up. You look all elegant, Bob. Well, no, I have days. I have two days of beard stubble, John. Because I'm am I allowed to say I'm playing the killer? Don't say the show, but yes, I'm the secret killer. The secret killer. <laughs> secret killer. But we're not allowed to say what episode, what show I'm doing. Otherwise, all right. I'll be in NDA hell. All okay. right, all right. <laughs> we won't talk about that at all. We'll, we'll edit around. How does this sound if I use? Uh, should I use the headphones or should I simply speak as I was speaking? Um, I mean, you sounded fine, so I'm good. I sounded way. fine before. Yeah. And John, do you have headphones or not? I don't have headphones. No, I'm, right. I'm not wearing pants. Don't have headphones. headphones and we're working on my end, so I gave them up. <laughs> all right. Now, of course, oh. I have no sound at all. Oh, because you sound better. There. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah, now I can hear you all oh, too well. Now you sound positively mellifluous. <laughs> mellifluous. That's cool. That's what I was aiming for. Hi, Bob. All right. How are you? I'm good, John. How are you? I miss you. I'm good. I miss you, too. Will we be seeing each other at the, the Way of All Flesh in late August or not? Uh, yes, we will. Actually, cool. I sent a little. I sent a little note to everybody about the uh, Trek talks. Uh, That's uh, right. We are. Yeah. We're on. We're on for the um, the Orville panel. That's right. We're on for the Orville panel. If you if you happen to be free and you want to stop by a little cocktail party as kind of a kickoff event for the Trek talks that's taking place on Saturday at six. But I know everybody's so jammed up that I don't 
I don't I, you know, I do, a, I do a music show that I've done on the cruise ship, and I think oh. that's exactly when we're rehearsing with the orchestra. But yeah, I will be there. Even, oh, we have rehearsal. All right. That's, yeah. If I, if, if I, if I can, because I could use a drink before I sing, usually. Oh, great. It's at the that's Delano, great. which is unfortunately a, just a little bit away from Bali's, but it's a pet house suite, la di da. And who's who is sponsoring this? Um, a lovely couple named Amy Simon and um, or Amy and her husband Simon. They have a welter of last names. I can never remember what the hell they are. She changed her name <laughs> to his name. He said no. Let's do a joint name. She goes by her maiden name. I don't even know. anyway. They donated twelve thousand dollars to the Food Coalition. They've been great supporters. Oh, wow, and to throw oh, a little. Wonderful. Oh. Yeah, they wanted to throw a little cocktail party as kind of a very informal little kickoff announcement thing that we're going to do this again. So I'm just trying to see if I, I can if it. I can, because I'm a big supporter of your group. I will be there if I can. Please much, much, much obliged. I will All right, so I just start so whenever you want. Yeah, well, we we are, are effectively started. No, oh, okay, so, uh, fabulous. This is what always happens to me, Bob. I don't know about you. I just enter, 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 talking, as uh, <laughs> Carl Reiner said. You know, and the next thing you know, there's the show without any formal introductions. Nobody even knows who the fuck I am. It's like this guy just came on and started gabbing. <laughs> so, if you have anything you want to say about us, uh, we'll have at it. Now's your chance. Well, we'll say, first off, uh, that I, I literally just talked to Seth on uh, Saturday uh, about the Orville. So I, that was one thing I wanted to mention about you guys working together on that. The first time I guess you actually ever did work together. That's right. We don't count personal appearances. Yeah, that's um, right. That's right. So, but yes, the first time we acted together, um, uh, John and, Carroll... and the last time by a special clause that Bob <laughs> so has inserted in his contracts. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. Well, John's character tried uh, to kill me. I mean, he had his own. Um, he had his own reasoning, his own point of view, uh, and. Uh, Probably there were certain uh, enterprise um, constituents who wished that he had killed me, but um, but at the end, I think uh, I got out of it. Right? I didn't. You, did. I didn't you got out. You got out of it. Your daughter killed me. Oh, that's right. um, let I'm it be sorry. said this is now again well do you need to introduce us to, i mean people don't know who the fuck we are <laughs> yes they do yes they, they what totally if they don't what they if know they don't the you interview all see. sorts of people my, my, you, i'm using the regular f-bomb is john billingsley and the one who's not is robert picard yeah i do all my f-bombs off camera as john well knows classy bob and trashy john <laughs> it's sort of like having patty and kathy from the patty duke show <laughs> Kathy adores the minuet, the ballet russe, and crepe Suzette. Patty likes to rock and roll. A hot dog makes her lose control. Sure. Is that what that lyric was? I spent what do 47 I years. I but no they're cousins. I had a cousin. And you'll find one pair of crazy bookends. Different night and day. And day. I don't know why that theme song is stuck in my head all these years. I just kind of <laughs> yeah, the, the idea that they were able to use ballet russe and crepe Suzette in a theme song, I think yeah. is inspired. That's amazing. No, it is. It's, and and also she was uh, and remained throughout her life an extraordinary talent, Patty Gordner. And, and William Shallard, who led our William Shallard. Yes, not Shallard. Shallard, I believe, is the onion like thing you try. I said up I said Shallard. Oh, you said Shallard. S C H A L L E R T. I'll even spell I, it. I worked with William Shallard, I believe, more than I worked with you. I was in a couple of Joe Dante movies. Yeah, so <laughs> why am I not talking with him? The mere fact that he passed away, sadly. I know. I know. And still, and he was still, he was, first he, was the first, he was the first choice still. <laughs> Even dead, we would have preferred to have William Shallard over John Billingsley. And of course, he had the Trek connection, too. Did you see how I got my name in there, since Will's not going to formally introduce me? John Billingsley. John Billing you did. Well, why don't you introduce yeah. me to you? Me or Will? No, I'll no, no. Bob, Bob Picardo. Robert Picardo, extraordinary actor, wonderful human being. For all the fact that I like nothing better than to make fun of Bob Picardo, I think this man is the salt of the goddamn earth. And I would go to any ends to, get to, to to act with him or to be with him or to sleep in his guest house. Well, thank you very much, John. Do you I have a guest house? Uh, not anymore. No, I don't. I once had a guest house. Yeah, I was working at times. Uh, okay. And if I still have one, I can't remember where it is. So, But, that, <laughs> but every I, I accept that compliment and back at you. I have a, a, a great affection and admiration for Mr. Billingsley as well. Now, sadly... He was on the spectacularly unsuccessful iteration of Star Trek known as Enterprise. The one speaking, that killed the franchise is what I, was, I like to call it. Yeah. I was speaking to a young Star Trek fan yesterday, and by young, I mean under 60, 
And uh, he said, I don't know. I loved Enterprise. I don't know, you know, what everyone's uh, beef was with it. So there you go. There you go. Um, and my favorite Bob Picardo story, let's just start this out on the right footing, is that Bob, out of nowhere, one day I got an email from Bob that said, just thought you'd like to know, a recent poll on the internet said, I was voted most popular doctor and you are the least popular doctor. Hope you're doing well. Bye, Bob. It was like, intended. It was humorous, John. It was an intended. Like, it was a push poll. It was only actually conducted amongst members of Bob's immediate family. So it was like, okay, all right, fine. But, you know. <laughs> And that, as far as I'm concerned, that was the gauntlet thrown down. I picked it up, and here we have been it's living true. this life ever we, since. We move seamlessly between adoring each other and ridiculing each other without, with exactly. sometimes less than a second to transition. Exactly. Who's the cute ass right there? <laughs> oh, thank you. Please. I blush. That is one of my cats. Uh, he'll he'll be walking through periodically. Um, we had, uh, you want to come down and say hi? This is Boo. Uh, he's now sitting on the printer, which he's destined to break one day. <laughs> uh, brother and sister, Boo and Squeaks, we adopted them about Almost. a year ago. They're six years old. We had uh, we had been three years without cats after our boy cat of 23 died. Wow. Uh, and that was devastating for the missus. So uh, we uh, and we were doing so much work with the Hollywood Food Coalition. It was like, I don't think we've got the time. But then we've kind of scaled back. And now we adopted these kitty cats. And I just adore them. And he is he is particularly my cat he follows me everywhere like i only cool. saw the rear third of him for a second but that is a siamese right? no he's not actually he is a um oh god what is it called um a breed a ragdoll oh, he's half he's half ragdoll and half uh tabby <laughs> um his sister doesn't look much like him until you kind of spend some time with him and you see it in the face, the the bone structure is similar. But he's just a sweetie pie. I just love him so much. And I've forgotten how much I love cats. And I'm, I've had cats my whole life. I've, I've missed having them. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll ask the obligatory origin story of both of you. How did you each get into acting in the first place? Uh, John, since I'm the old man, should I start or do you want you to should start? start? You should start. Because okay. that was back in back in back in the vaudeville days, wasn't it? I think it was back in exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. I uh, my first role, I played a, a Kanga in Winnie the Pooh Kindergarten. Not a not a spectacularly well received performance. So I don't recall acting again until about ninth grade, <laughs> when the uh, class clown, if you can believe it, I was the secondary class clown. The, 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 <laughs> the primary. I was a ter tertiary <laughs> class clown. So. I... <laughs> This, the uh, primary class clown, a guy named Bill Barker, pushed me into a one-act farce called Box and Cox about two guys who live in the same apartment but don't know it because one works by day, one works by night, and the landlord, landlady is getting double rent. It's quite funny. It was written in the mid-19th century. It makes fun of all the ridiculous uh, coincidences in melodrama. Well, although he had the... Um, the broader character, I set up all his jokes and I got laughs of my own and that's what hooked me. So I started to act regularly in high school because I was not good at sports and I went to a boys school and the only way to meet girls was to be in the school play because we did those with the neighboring girls school. At least that's the way I'm analyzing my behavior in retrospect. Went off to Yale ostensibly to be a doctor that I was a biology major, but I continued to act and I had an experience at Yale that kind of turned my head around a quasi professional uh, show, the Bernstein Mass, Leonard Bernstein came to see it, um, called me the great Picardo, I think, cause my name sounded like Caruso to him and he was probably poking fun at me, but encouraged me to get out of pre-med and into a theater major, which I did, went to New York and I peaked at around 24 years old. <laughs> I got my first lead on Broadway at 23, a play called Gemini with Danny Aiello playing my father. I had the primary role. Um, it started off off broad. I'm sorry, it started in regional theater, moved off Broadway, moved to Broadway and carried me with it. <laughs> While I was in that, I was seen by the appropriate powers that be. And I was cast as Jack Lemmon's son the following Broadway season in a play called Tribute. And I shared the stage with Mr. Lemon for about a year between um, pre-Broadway, Broadway, and then doing it again in LA. And that was literally the peak of my career. It's, it's been downhill since then. That brought me to LA, started to work in film and television, and eventually was cast on Star Trek. Um, 
after, I guess my first big role was China Beach, but Star Trek was the role everybody remembers you for because it's such an extraordinary um, fan base and it remains evergreen. There, there are new iterations of the franchise all the time. And when people get hooked on it, they go back and view all of the prior ones. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's great. There's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be part of. I've met an, a great extended family of actors colleagues and close friends including mr billingsley because there are by and large there are no real bad apples in the star trek franchise they all seem to be cool and interesting people i mean there's a few exceptions that we won't discuss but uh (laughs) but anyway that's that's all i want to talk about now that brings me to this moment now that i i took i don't know two and a half minutes there so john you could have at least 30 seconds all right (laughs) <laughs> Fabulous. Um, we lived down south. We moved up to suburban Connecticut. I talk like this. Northern children tried to beat that accent out of me. I was a pariah. But we had mandatory school auditions in the fifth grade for A Christmas Carol. And because I witnessed my shelves, I loved to read. I could actually lift the words from the page with some degree of, of feeling. So I got cast as the lead. And for one brief, glorious period of time, I was popular. And then the, the show ended and they went back to beating the shit out of me and I was a pariah again. But that moment in the sun actually led me to think, oh, well, this this is the career for me. And it was all based on vainglory, consequently. There was no, you know, real artistic impulse behind it. It was just like, similar to Bob, it's like, girls, money, glory, bound to follow. Look at what happened in the fifth grade, for God's sake. My parents very graciously supported that uh, urge because they didn't take it seriously. And they uh, got me signed up with acting classes with a soap opera couple who had been on The Guiding Light, Ed and Dorothy Bryce. So I took acting classes uh, on and off my teenage years. I went to Bennington College intending to be a writer. I had the misfortune and the good fortune. This is somewhat similar. Actually, Bob, Bob, my story tracks with you up, up until the time you went Broadway, at which point my story diverges into pathos. But uh, I went to school to be something else. I went to school to be a writer. And I studied with Bernard Malamud, one of the great writers of the 20th century. And I realized I ain't no fucking writer. Um, So I skedaddled off to the drama department because the faculty wasn't as good and they weren't likely to belittle me with as much severity. So I became an actor and I moved to Seattle. I started a theater company devoted to adapting fiction for the stage. I was an acting teacher. I did regional theater and I moved to LA when I was around 35 because I was broke and my wife had divorced me and I thought, fuck this shit. I got into film and TV. I too am probably primarily known for being on Star Trek, even if I was on the show that killed the franchise. And um, I uh, have a a sidebar career uh, playing uh, child molesters and serial killers. And that takes us pretty much up to date. (laughs) And when I first heard after uh, Voyager ended, you know, the Enterprise, of course, was going to be the one that it was not your father's Star Trek. It was going to redefine the franchise. And suddenly our cast, the last couple of episodes was, you know, they're building the Enterprise sets and it's like, don't let the door, you know, hit you in the ass. It was <laughs> like we, they couldn't wait to get to tear our sets down and build the Enterprise sets. That's the first thing I heard. Then when I ran into people who still worked, you know, uh, after I was gone, I would run into people uh, from the production or speak to them. And they all said, oh, John Billingsley, he's such a nice fellow. And I'm thinking, what am I? Wasn't I nice? It's like, no, John is really, he's so nice. And everybody really likes him. That was what they kept telling me. So, really, of course, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know this. I think this I did. Yeah. No, I mean, you were, you were very uh, well loved. They also talked about how uh, you, uh, along with Scott, of course, were the most uh, experienced actors in the company. And I knew Scott slightly from when I was on China Beach. He was on, uh, quantum leap Leap, and we we were in an awards ceremony together where he won a major award and i won kind of a small pathetic award and uh so i had known him for years and i i was very excited to hear that he was joining the franchise because uh because he's a, a wonderful actor and and you know they the show is really defined usually by the captain but I had, because I'm the kind of kind Christian soul I am, I had absolutely no schadenfreude when Enterprise didn't run the full seven years because by then I had met the cast members and I liked them all. So my initial, you know, my initial feeling of, uh, you know, when we were shut, shuttled 
off <laughs> of the Paramount lot as quickly as possible and hearing how gloriously wonderful the new Doctor was on the new Star Trek series, um, I eventually, uh, you know, I settled into this, I think it's unfair that they didn't run the full seven years. It probably had more to do with the fact that there had been so much continuous Star Trek for so long that the audience uh, needed a break and they simply got blamed for it. Um, There's a lot going on. I think the other thing is that we were on UPN. We weren't syndicated and mm -hmm. UPN was a dying network. We found out we went to a convention in San Antonio early on and nobody showed up and we thought, well, this is curious. There's like six people in the audience. And we found out that the affiliate stations weren't required to air anything on UPN. So they always postponed us or canceled us outright to air high school football games. Uh, and so no one had any knowledge of Enterprise. That was sort of when I think we all began to go, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and a parenthetical remark, I think also um, the writers and the creators of Enterprise, Rick and Brandon, would, would very, very honestly say that they needed a year off. So I think for all that we were trumpeted to be not your daddy Star Trek, in fact, I think we became your daddy Star Trek. And I think <laughs> some of the some of the fan fatigue came in part because the expectation of something that was truly completely breath of fresh air was not necessarily met by the uh, eventual product. Not to say that there wasn't much to recommend Enterprise, because I think there was, but it didn't quite diverge enough from what had come before for it to live up to its advanced billing. I would just say, as an Enterprise fan, my favorite parts were actually toward the end of the run when the Reeve Stevens came on. And we're working on the show. The Reeve Stevens and Manny Cotto, and I think Manny had, you know, had a lot to do with it. He was actually a, a real fan of the original series. And perversely, once we realized that there was no way in God's green earth we were going to get a season five, Manny was given, you know, handed the keys to the car and said, you know, do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> so Manny made a lot of episodes that were very much Valentine's to the original show. How Absolutely. did the Klingons get their funny heads or, or, or you know, or, or how did they... You know, I, I don't remember the stories all that well, but <laughs> there were a number of them that were kind of, you know, riffs on the original show. And I think yeah. the fans really appreciated the direction we were beginning to go in. Um, but, you know, what are you going to do? As the guy who wore the rubber head, I have to say, when they announced the show wasn't coming back, I might have been the only person on the set who was like, oh, that's too fucking bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> rubber, rubber head wearing is 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 uh, is is not without it. No, the, and and you have my admiration and respect for that. Early in my career, I did some very heavy makeup roles, and what your audience may or may not know is that I, uh, when I was asked to read for the Doctor, I turned it down, read the whole script, and asked to read for Neelix. So I very nearly, you know, spent six thousand hours in the makeup chair. Um, at my own stupidity, because in reading the pilot, I thought Neelix was the better part. And I tested for Neelix. It was between me, Ethan Phillips, who's an old friend of mine, although I didn't know he was my competition, and a wonderful British actor who had just starred in Topsy Turvy about Gilbert and Sullivan. He played W.S. Gilbert. Sorry, I don't remember his name. In any case, I, I came so close to getting that part, didn't get it. The producers came back and said, would he read for the original role we were interested in him for? because there's something about his voice or whatever they said. And I said to my agent, I don't get the joke, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> and, when it, and I think uh, my children taught me later in life, they were quite young when I got the part, but my children insist the reason I succeeded so well in the doctor, uh, the doctor role is that I have what they call resting bitch face, <laughs> <laughs> which is when my face is at rest, I look very unhappy, very unhappy with you, very unhappy about my general circumstances. And because I never smiled in the show and basically had resting bitch face for all of season one, all of season two, and part of season three. I think <laughs> That's that funny because I'm the opposite. I think whatever the opposite of resting bitch face is, my face looks like the, the face of the person who's just kind of light, lit the match that's stuck into your shoe. You know, <laughs> and, and so uh, that which worked well for my character. It's like, you know, I've got something up my sleeve. Uh, Impish, so I, we should have a show. You, Bob, you and together. I should have a fun show. Rest, resting bitch and the imp. <laughs> the imp and bitch like the, the show you referenced earlier box and box and cox imp and bitch i'm putting it into the pitch right away yeah yeah 
Actually, I do have I do have a pitch called Old Fat Flocks. Old Fat Flocks just kind of like this is so I can get like a lot of money to only work half a day. He begins the episode by sitting in a rocking chair and kind of recounting stories from his past. And then you get the flashback music and young lists some actors run around in their underpants and acting all that. And then it comes back to me at the end and I go, stay tuned for another episode of Old Fat Flocks next week. End of scene. Pop show. <laughs> Half a day's work. Dear Paramount Plus, have I got an idea? Uh, I know. I know. If 75,000 people write letters, it's got a shot. <laughs> oh, now you're. Oh, all right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't be. Get, nice. get out of here. Get out of here. That was <laughs> just, just blasting through the frame for a second. There. Yeah. Oh, uh, he'll be. He'll, he'll, he's going to make multiple trips. <laughs> this is his, this is his favorite place. <laughs> Oh, wait a second. I have to be concerned about something for a second. Talk amongst yourselves. All right. <laughs> this is a cat. This is a cat issue. Concerned, right? what do we think? Is this an off-camera barf or just uh No, this is the cat is sitting on a shelf that I'm not sure is gonna hold his weight. <laughs> ah, I think that would be cat weight. 22 pounds. He's a big boy. It's not uh -huh. so much his weight as it is that the shelf itself, I think, is somewhat <laughs> precarious. But I just want to make sure there we go. Okay, boo. Fortunately, when you have a lot of books, it's always easy to support a shelf. Okay, boom. All right, there. I'm back. You didn't see that I wasn't wearing pants, did you? No, uh, you're far you know. I recall, if you have pants, you take them off on stage. So we're all expecting you to have no pants on. <laughs> I hate pants. <laughs> if, I could, if I could change one thing. Right. right. <laughs> really. And that actually led to his career playing perverts and child molesters, right? The fact actually, that, that was the first professional <laughs> role I got cast. And this is what you learn when you get out of college. I don't know if this is Bob's experience. Bob, Bob, Bob's been able to play a, a wider array of, of, of erudite and, and, uh, and charming and sophisticated and handsome fellows. The first role I got cast in was a uh, retarded boy with cerebral palsy who urinated on stage. Uh, in a in a Canadian play called um, oh God what was it I can't remember it was about life at a, at a at a residential center for people at cerebral palsy it was actually kind of a big hit in Seattle and and you know in my small scale way that kind of got my professional career started in regional theater but uh, at the time you think I'm going to play and then I'll be Hamlet and then I'll no no you're going to play child molesters retarded people <laughs> and losers now did you. Did you have a stunt urine bag, or was that your own urine that you had to do? Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, I, I only know that I, I think I, I don't know whether I got the part in spite of or because of the fact that when I auditioned, I did reveal my wiener. Right, but <laughs> can you have me audition with that scene? It's like, well, you know, I'm not shy. I want to show that that I'm not shy. When the actual urination scene took place, I was facing upstage, and there was some effect that allowed the sound effect I to see. convey the the actual urination. Because actors are always, you know, uh, uh, amazed with uh, actors and actresses who can cry on cue. But this is, uh, but urin urinating on cue is something we're called less upon to do. Indeed. But I, I have no doubt that you Indeed. could do it. <laughs> Indeed, I, I could do it easier now than I could when I was at that age. <laughs> That's I, true. Now you can. Now do I've got to... urine to spare. Exactly, <laughs> ten to twelve performances in a day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, were you expecting a highbrow interview, Will? By any chance, I should uh, let just. You've uh, absolutely you know. met every expectation I had. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Notice what a sophisticated answer he gave there. <laughs> but I do have a, a stock question that I ask everybody, which is: uh, We were going to see if you get through the whole interview with only you getting to ask one question. That's always kind of my goal. <laughs> well, you know, you you would tie. You know, then so far, you've only gotten one question in. <laughs> well, at least one stock one, anyway. Yeah. Uh, who was the first person that you remember having to fight the instinct to kind of fanboy out on when you work with them? Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> nice. What show was that on? Diagnosis Murder. I, I mean, I certainly had worked with people who were, who were, you know, accomplished and celebrated, but Dick Van Dyke, I grew up with Dick Van Dyke, you know, the da -da -dee -da -dee -da -dee -dee. and he kind of came sort of traipsing onto the stage doing his sort of Dick Van Dyke, you know, little uh, jiggy thing and i was just like <laughs> i became more <laughs> well i had more time to prepare but i have to say jack lemon because at 24 years old i was a huge fan of his primarily from the odd couple um some like it hot and uh you know i'd seen many of his roles not all of them uh of course by the time i worked with him but because i was going to work with him and i i never read with him when i got the part i read 
three times with the actress I was going to play opposite, who ended up being Catherine Hicks, also a Star Trek um, oh. franchise member. Oh. And um, but when I first met Jack, I because I, I was extremely shy and um, respectful, but he put me at ease right away, and I never felt. I never felt nervous around him at all, but he was a huge star to me. So I would, I would say that on film, the first television role I had, uh, an actor who was slightly intimidating, not necessarily one I fanboyed out on, but, uh, I was on Kojak with Telly Savalas. Oh, wow. Ah. And I think I, it was the, when they started shooting in New York, I was about, I want to say 22 years old. I joined SAG to do it. And during a rehearsal, my character was a bad kid who was the son of uh, Telly, you know, Kojak's favorite restaurant owner. So Kojak always went to the same Italian restaurant. And, the, and my dad played by a wonderful actor named Sully Boyer, who was in Dog Day Afternoon, playing the bank manager who has a heart attack. He was great. Uh, anyway, Sully said to, to uh, Kojak, uh, would you watch my son? He's getting mixed up with bad kids. So I had this big scene where I had to yell at Kojak and, you know, and we're rehearsing it. And while we're rehearsing it, I'm yelling at him. He's sitting at the table finishing his spaghetti at my father's restaurant. <laughs> a tiny little glob of spit kind of projected out of my mouth and landed directly on Telly's head. And I could see it from my, you know, from eight feet away, this little glistening, <laughs> shiny glob of my own spit. And I almost forgot my lines. It was only <laughs> rehearsal, but I thought, What's the protocol when you spit on the star? <laughs> do you let it, do you let it air dry? Do you buff it out really quickly? What do you do? And I remember panicking in that moment. He never said anything about it. And at the end of the scene, he came up and slapped me on the shoulder and went, "Good kid," like that. So I guess you know he it was forgiven that I wow. spit on. Do you think he even grokked that he had? He I don't even think he probably didn't it? feel it, you know, because uh, it was a very big head and a very small. You know, the, the irony is when we were doing Orville, something similar happened. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. this. There was a huge globule of my saliva on your head. <laughs> remember this? And I, I, I too thought, how do I call this to Bob's <laughs> attention? So I, I don't, I don't think you remember this. So I took a black magic marker and I outlined it in hopes <laughs> that maybe that would. And it's still and, so I and then, so I drew a big arrow and it still didn't. And then you and then you signed it and auctioned my head on eBay. <laughs> I know. I got everybody on the crew to go like, and it still didn't. Seth did a little tap dance. Saliva on the head. Saliva on the head. I wonder if Bob will know it when he goes to bed. You don't remember any of this. I don't. And now that you've said it, I'm afraid I'll never forget it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the cyclical nature of life, I guess. Yeah. Actually, speaking of first roles on camera, I, obviously IMDb is notoriously oh, inconsistent. God. But... Uh, terrified of what this question is going to be <laughs> were you indeed john a patient on northern exposure uh yes i don't think that was not my first role on camera however oh, that, that's what they claim it was but uh... no they are they are wrong whoever they are they don't know shit um i mean obviously my first role on camera would have been you know some some precious student film i did at bennington <laughs> college but the first role that ever saw the light of day was probably <laughs> A movie that I'm I'm loath to suggest anybody uh, ever go see called um, I think I might have repressed the name. Bo Bridges directed it. Not Bo Bridges was a wonderful, wonderful actor. Um, uh, and and I'm now I'm of course spacing on what the fuck it is. He played a judge who's seven hours to judgment. Seven hours to judgment. Um, and they, that's how long they, the movie seemed. <laughs> that's how long my scene seemed. Um, they cast me as a. Uh, I, and I don't to this day quite know why. I, I think it's because I had moxie. Uh, I had no talent, but I had plenty of fucking moxie. So I went in an audition for Bo Bridges, and I, I uh, was auditioning for the part of a pawn shop owner. You know, I was like, I weighed 80 pounds. I was 24 years old. I was like, I had the most ridiculously angelic face. And I was supposed to be this kind of like, you know, yeah, what do you want? And he's uh, he's out to get something from me, and I pull my shotgun out and I chase him around the store, saying, "It's okay, I'm not going to shoot you. Don't worry. Come on out." <laughs> and uh, oh, at one point comes over and says, "You know, you you could you could probably do a you know just just do less, just do less." 
<laughs> a note I did not take <laughs> from the uh, eventual performance. So yes, I, I did more than exposure. I think was my first. Uh, actually, my first my first show was Christopher Closeup, which was a syndicated uh, PBS show in New York. I was fourteen, and I played a teenage alcoholic, oh, and wow. I doubtless overacted that as well. <laughs> Your uh, your story reminded me of one. Uh, this is a uh, Jack Lemon told the story of the first movie he made. It should happen to you, with um, Judy, Judy Holland, George Cukor directing. Jack has just come off a, a Broadway revival of Room Service, and he's acting up a storm. This is his own story. So afterwards, he would say, uh, after a take, he'd go up to Mr. Cukor and say, "How was that, Mr. Cukor?" And, and George Cukor would say, "Good, Jack, good, but uh, but less, less." <laughs> and then this happened several days in a row, right? You know, he really thought he nailed it. And Kukor would say, good, good, but, but less, less. And finally, Jack blew up and said, if I do any less, I won't be acting at all. And Kukor went. That's what your story reminded me of. It was something yeah. I kept in my mind. Every time you're giving a... Every time we're gilding the lily, or should I say, hanging too many ornaments on the tree, as I say, especially with a one scene part, we act, we we often go in, and the scene. I think of the scene as the Christmas tree, and how many ornaments can you hang on before it absolutely topples over? <laughs> so uh, it is. So it is, a, it is a thin line. It is a thin line in our business between you know um, wanting you 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 get into this because you have a playful nature, and so you certainly want to kind of throw your elbows out and recognizing particularly on film and TV that, um, you know, the story is, is paramount and your, <laughs> your personal <laughs> need is not the reason you're here. Uh, what was your first on camera role, Bob? Uh, well, I mean, I did an educational film of six characters in search of an author playing the young actor that was non-union, but that was the first time I really had to do anything dramatic. Uh, and it exists somewhere. It was used in schools forever. It was a shortened version of the Pirandello play. So I've talked to people over the years who saw me in that. I don't think I ever saw my performance in it. But the uh, Kojak was my first SAG job. That was the I was about 21, 22. And, uh, and that was in New York. And the first job I got in L.A., after I came out to recreate the play, the role with Jack Lemmon in L.A., I got cast on Taxi. So that was the first uh, job I got in L.A. And that was a lot of fun. That was. Uh, Did you intend was, to stick around in L.A.? Did you? I intend to New York, or? It, like many actors, I thought I'll s spend six months. And in the first five months, all I'd gotten was I met a lot of casting directors, and I got the taxi episode. But just as my six months was ending, I was cast in a four-hour miniseries based on a Harold Robbins novel called *The Dream Merchants*. Sure. And uh, the young star was Mark Harmon, who was newly, you oh. know, converted from college football star to actor. Yeah. And I was his nemesis. My He was in business with my father, played by Vincent Gardenia, who was a, yeah. who had started a movie studio. And I was supposed to be Jack Warner Jr. I was the guy <laughs> who fought with his father, got thrown off the lot when he married a starlet, Morgan Fairchild, that his father didn't like. It was very kind of... Um, cheesy kind of uh, what's the word uh just soap opera like but we had a great classic hollywood director named vincent sherman who directed the hasty heart and a number of other uh, classic black and white films and he and it was great to work with an old pro like that it was my first job i remember the sound man coming up to me and saying you don't have to talk so loud the microphone <laughs> is right here because <laughs> i was still playing to the second balcony you know yeah um, but I learned a lot doing that, and I made some friends in that show forever. Uh, Kay Ballard played my mother, and because oh, wow. of Kay Ballard's friendship with Doris Day, I had dinner with Doris Day <laughs> twice. Oh now that was, she was probably in her middle 50s, still beautiful, and I was like sitting opposite. It, she and Kay were talking, and I was just staring at her the whole <laughs> meal. I was all of, you know, 25 years old, and Doris yeah. Day quite the still the eiffel in her 50s yes, absolutely and super charming so there's certain things and then of course the other great thing about coming to hollywood is 
working with Jack Lemmon, I met every star of his generation. So it was really cool in my 20s to meet a lot, a lot, a lot of famous people. But the one who stands out at a party at Jack's house, I was surprised to see Fred Astaire there. Oh, my so God. I met Fred Astaire, and that was like, you know, because I back in college when everyone else was playing Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, I was playing starring Fred Astaire. <laughs> and I knew every lyric to every song he'd ever sung in a movie. That was really cool. That's awesome. How did you fall in with Joe Dante? Joe saw me in the play with Jack Lemmon. Um, and the character, because I had to explode on stage and yell at my father, who I was angry at, I, for some reason, he went, that's my werewolf. I mean, he, uh, I guess because the character <laughs> had to really um, get upset quickly. So I read for I read for the role, but I but he had seen the play, and I remember distinctly scaring the casting director without ever laying a hand on her. I scared her, and that's what got me the part. I think uh, I've scared many a casting director <laughs> many than I ever worked at all. Well, don't we should tell young listeners don't, don't scare don't, the cast. Director. Don't scare the casting director. Never, ever, ever. Don't bring show them your wiener. Don't take your clothes off during an audition. And don't, don't bring a knife to an audition. Please. Yes. I simply asked her to face the director while I read, and I stood behind her. Because in the scene, that's what happened. I was not supposed to... Um, uh, the character was... was She was watching a movie, and I come up behind her, and I'm speaking in her ear. But I don't recall ever laying a hand anywhere near her but my voice i got down on one knee and got right behind her ear and it was the expression on her face that got me the part <laughs> <laughs> i had an audition in uh, in seattle where i lived for a number of years where i where eventually started a theater company when i was auditioning for regional theater for um the rocky horror picture show oh. and i i could neither sing nor dance so i thought well the only reason i'm going to get cast is because something in my in my manner or my my behavior or my my way of looking at the world is going to resonate with them so i came in and auditioned with a medley of songs from my fair lady i had a i had a butcher knife and a teddy bear and i sang don't talk of love dee, 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 while i eviscerated the teddy bear <laughs> and then i smoothly segued to i've grown accustomed to your face and i put the stuffing back in the teddy bear <laughs> <laughs> with the idea being that I would end this um, by, by you know, cuddling the teddy bear and walking off stage. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't really know what I was thinking through my entire 20s, frankly. But, you know, er, occasionally in an audition, you will realize, like, within three beats, that it's like, can I leave? Can I just stop right now? Because I, I know that this is already a failure. I can see the look of horror in your face, but I'm only in the first note of the song. So I had to go through the whole thing. <laughs> Never bring a butcher knife or possibly a teddy bear into an audition. Yes, please. Never anything. Never. No, no. It's, don't it's do true. anything Never. that John Billingsley did. Ever. Yeah. And don't ever even mention the name John Billingsley no, as an no. it's it's in best, life. You know, you know who I, who's, his career I modeled myself on John Billingsley. Get out! Get out! <laughs> <laughs> Well, Bob talked about his audition for uh, Voyager, but what was your audition situation when uh, we, you went to Enterprise? I, apparently, I've never really changed because uh, the only thing I got <laughs> as an audition, uh, you know, they don't always send you the script. I don't know if you got the script for Voyager, the pilot script. I did not get it yet. So they, they, they're very, they were, you know, protective, as is, is frequently the case in Hollywood. They don't want the material out in the world. So I got two pages. Come in with a slight alien accent. Like, all right, slight alien accent. So, you know, Bonnie and I, like, you know, I tried funny voices and blah, blah, blah. And I decided that perhaps on his home planet, he was a bird and that in moments of joyous transport, he would squawk with glee. So I came in and I auditioned. And clearly the character was buoyant and had a, you know, very upbeat philosophy. So I thought I could support that. So blah, 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 blah. And I get the fucking job. It's like, oh. And, you know, I wasn't up again. They just offered it to me. It's like, you know, I mean, I had to go do it again for the, you know, the network people, but there was nobody else that they were considering. So it's like, I guess I'm a bird. I went to makeup. <laughs> they didn't make me look like a bird. Wardrobe didn't make me look like a bird. First table read. I, I squawked. I turned to Rick and Brandon. I said, by the way, am I a bird? Should I be thinking bird or, you know, because they don't look like a bird. And, and, and Rick and Brandon, who are inscrutable, you know, by nature, they both kind of went, <laughs> I, I had no fucking idea up until the first day we're shooting i had no idea whether i was a bird or not 
So <laughs> the very first rehearsal, the very first scene I'm in, blah, 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 blah. blah. And the director, Jim Conway, said, John, quit fucking around, which is how I knew I was not a bird. <laughs> um, so, yeah. That's a funny story. I love that story. <laughs> it's very, uh, very strange and, and, and true. Uh, Dominic Keating, who was, uh, was on the show, played Malcolm. He, uh, he has an un un unfortunate habit of going to conventions and telling all my stories. So whenever I, I'm i up on stage, it's like, you know, has anybody heard that? Yeah, we heard that one from Dominic. <laughs> Tell your own stories. I, I did. I did also. I got cast because I uh, inadvertently ripped off um, DeForest Kelly. It was not intentional. I was not savvy enough about the, the, a Star Trek and the franchise to have made this intentional choice. <laughs> but I heard, when I read for the doctor, I heard that they had read 900 actors. I don't know if that's true. They wanted the character to be funny. There was nothing funny in the scene. There were nine lines, nothing funny to me, yeah. except that he was cranky, that's it. But there was no end, there was no out to the scene. Um, he's been left, his program has been left running in sick bay and he has nothing to do and he's not happy about that. So the last scripted line, I'm talking to the computer and it's a wide shot. And I'm saying uh, the, the, the last line in the audition scene was, I believe someone has failed to terminate my program. And after that line, I took a long deadpan look at the 14 people staring at me and said, I'm a doctor, not a nightlight. And they hired me that day. Uh, and, it, uh, and I told DeForest Kelly that, I, that I, my character paid homage to him and he went, oh, you mean you steal from me? And I said, yeah, pretty, yes, yes, sir, pretty much. That's it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. There is, there is, you know, I know Bob would agree. There is such a fine line, too. I mean, you really have to kind of be prepared to come in and, and, and know that a whole shitload of people are auditioning. And that, you know, there's something that they're looking for that is, 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 is unique. And at the same time, you know, I don't know, you probably had this experience too, Bob. There's also that line where where if you go off script too much, you're, you might get smacked because some people are extremely precious. So there's always that fine line. I did an audition for Ch Chicago Hope one time. And, and similarly, because frequently if these scenes are small, there's not a button. There's not really an out. And, and I... I, like you, provided an out, only to be told by, I think, John Tinker, stick to the script as written. Yeah. It's like, right. do you want me to go back and do it again? Or should I just leave? Yeah, just um, leave. <laughs> just leave. <laughs> you know? No, it's true. I, I, you don't know. It's amazing that the times I think that I, I've gotten hired, I broke the rules, but I broke them successfully. I mean, I got away with it, yeah. but but you know, when they see that many people, I did something far more outrageous. You don't ad lib in Star Trek. You just, it's not done. I mean, you're not spontaneous in Star Trek. If you want Which to be is a drag, because witness what Bob did is fucking great. And you, I wish they would give you a little more. But they, here's what I figured out. You can be spontaneous on Star Trek as long as you're spontaneous five days in advance. So if you have an idea for a line, you, I would call the producers and say on this page, and I would suggest the line. They wrote them down. Ah. And then and then if they showed up in the colored pages in the next couple of days with a little asterisk next to it as an added line, I knew they liked it. And that's the that was the format I learned for making a suggestion. You never do it on the set because you're going to slow production down while they go call the producer on the phone. And, and, and then 120 people are standing there doing nothing while they find out if you can add your line. So I understand there. I, I do understand... Um, why did i lose you guys up oh, no, i no. do understand why they don't want you to do that but in my audition i did another terrible no-no before the added line <laughs> the the poor casting director nan dutton did not was not the regular casting director junie lowry did your show enterprise she did all the other star trek yeah. shows but she had just had twin babies so a different casting director who i also knew nan dutton who was great sure. was exhausted i mean the look on her face oh no was, I'm so sorry I took this job, always, when you read for uh, her. No. It's yeah. just going on and on and on. And the first scripted line, one of the scripted lines, I scan someone, 
And I say, your injuries are not serious. You can return to your station. That was the line. So I scanned poor Nan Dutton, who looked like she was ready to die. And I scanned her and said, your injuries are not serious. You can return to casting. And she, this is during my network audition. She went like this. She went and then burst out laughing. I woke her up, right? Now, you don't, you don't do that in a network audition, but I did. <laughs> but I did it completely deadpan and then just moved right on. And it was like, did we hear that right? You know, yeah. And, yeah. and again, yeah. I made I made her laugh, which I yeah. think said something. Yeah, I it's it's true. I, and, you know, you, on, on any show, you kind of feel out fairly quickly whether or not they give you latitude or they don't give you latitude. In those instances where they give you latitude, I think Bob and I probably are very similar in this respect. It's like, oh, latitude. Um, and in those instances where they don't, it's like, okay, you know, you, you know, you, you still, you put it, I think, very eloquently once, Bob, to me, you said, you know, the fun thing about this work is that, is that every, every scene and every part presents a series of interesting problems. It's a puzzle. And if you're interested in solving puzzles and problems, you really want to be able to kind of raise your hand and say, hey, hey, here's a thought, here's a thought. And you got to feel that out, you know, it depends on the people, depends upon how they take your personality, um, Always a challenge. But in a long running show, I say this to actor friends, you know, what is it like doing a series for multiple years? And I say, you really are the architect of your own happiness. They're going to give you, you know, you, you make, according to how you take the challenges they give you, how you deal with them, how you hopefully give them more ideas. They, they, they yeah. come up with a, an idea for your character that may be comic and you execute it well. You're going to get more stuff like that. And then the other actors who get bored, I find, are the ones that either don't give the producers, uh, they, they, they don't give new ideas for new storylines, either directly or they don't, they're not suggested by how they handle the last storyline they gave you. So really it's, it's a matter of, of uh, you know, just, taking what comes at you and in the most interesting and inventive way you can and still stay within the parameters of what the Bible of the show is, what the character is supposed to be. And I think that they respond, you know, I always found writers are very open um, to constructive suggestions. Here's if, a, if, a, if an actor reads a script and goes, this is a piece of shit, that's yeah. not a helpful note. Yeah. But if you, but if you give them, if you give them a, a, a an idea that helps them come up with a new story idea or whatever. It's very tough to come up with 25 stories, yeah. complicated stories in one season. So I've always gotten along very well with writers. Brandon Braga still teases me that back then he was still smoking and he would come out for a cigarette and I would jump out of a nearby bush going, you know, Brandon, I was thinking, you know. Bob is notorious. Bob's notorious. <laughs> Bob's notorious. Um, but he always says it. I'm sure he said it on the Orville set when we were there. Uh, but, uh, but we have a very, I, I have tremendous affection for him. He was inscrutable as uh, all of our producers were, but especially Brandon and Rick. But in the intervening years, I've gotten to know Brandon a lot, uh, a lot better. And, yeah. uh, we yeah. have a, and, and I love when he, uh, teases me, which he does like Billingsley quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I got into love. I did a really interesting um horror film based on a clive barker novel called uh, or a series of novellas called book books of blood or book of blood that uh that uh, brandon directed in nova scotia a few years back and as the first time i'd worked with brandon since enterprise and it was, it was actually really delightful because he'd never directed me before so it was really delightful to get to spend a little more time with him i got eaten alive by rats that wasn't the most fun thing in the world but um <laughs> But, oh no! Tell me, you were under trained rats, actual rats. Fortunately, when it came time for the rats to actually crawl on me, stunt guy. Uh -huh. they said, do you want to? Do you want to hang out and watch this? It was like no fucking way. I just <laughs> open those cages, and those rats are coming out. I am in my car. I'll see you later. <laughs> I had no interest in that. Yeah, However, that seemed, but, on yeah. on True Blood, when you had to caress the naked woman next to you, I don't believe you called the stunt. That character. was actually somewhat miserable. I was on True Blood, and uh, <laughs> you know what people don't realize, including my wife, especially my wife, is that L.A. is cold at night. You know, we're in the desert. Mm -hmm. And most of these scenes, the second season was a season-wide orgy. A demoness gets us all, everybody in the mm -hmm. town. 
or thraldom and so we're all you know fucking anything that moves i'm fucking trees i'm fucking you know you name it i'm fucking it and there's uh, there was a woman she was a uh, an extra god bless her and uh i did not know this at the time one you get paid by the breast so if you reveal two breasts that's 100 bucks and if you get if you reveal one breast that's 50 bucks what about three <laughs> <laughs> then you're working all the time baby you're not an extra <laughs> you're a principal if you got three breasts uh she only had two breasts they were they were you know significant breasts but i i was supposed to do be dirty dancing with her and she was continually trying to show both her breasts and they were saying just just we just want the one breast just keep that you know keep that second breast and she was trying to open the yeah keep that you know next we're gonna go again keep that i finally said i'm gonna give you 50 fucking bucks to just keep that fucking left breast covered <laughs> and i stiffed her i didn't give her the 50 bucks um so i get home and bonnie would say how was your day it's like oh, you know I, this woman with the breasts and i had to rub chocolate cake on her and she wouldn't stop talking and it was cold and my wife was like fuck you it's like it's true <laughs> so she i will finish this story really briefly she had a chance to audition for a horror movie um rob zombie was uh, filming um oh. in which uh, a coven of witches start the movie and they're all dancing around naked and doing horrible things and she was not going to audition i said oh you're auditioning <laughs> and i'm really wanting you to get this because i want you to experience the misery of being naked on a cold night in los angeles having to feign joy and she did get it and she came home and said okay i'm sorry you're right it's miserable <laughs> i'm so sad i brought that up <laughs> I, that's, yeah, yeah. I got one last question um, you've only asked two second. you realized you've only asked two questions so <laughs> okay to, uh, to close with though but uh uh setting star trek aside for both of you what's your favorite project you've worked on over the years that didn't get the love you thought it deserved it could be film tv it could be a pilot that didn't get picked up Probably like my first wife <laughs> <laughs> Bob, do you want to go? I'll go, and then you finish. You, you, should, yeah. take us out. you should take us out. Uh, probably The Nine, oh, uh, which was a short-lived series on ABC in yeah. 2004-ish with uh, Chai McBride, and um, who was fabulous in it, um, Tim Daly, Kim Raver, uh, about a group of people who are held hostage when a bank robbery goes awry. And the conceit was you, in half of the show, the first half of the show, you see what happens during this 48-hour uh, crisis, this hostage-taking crisis. It unfolds bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit. You know some people don't make it out alive, but you're not quite sure what happens, bit by bit, bit by bit. The second half of each episode is in real time. The survivors have survived, and now they're processing their grief, and they're getting on with their lives, and, and mysteries are solved. I thought it was a really interesting combination of a suspense and a drama and a soap, and it was a terrific cast, and it was the best part I've ever had on television. Because my guy was the sap who inadvertently becomes the hero. And so he, he which that, what happens sometimes on television is that you don't get to change a tremendous amount, you know, on episodic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's however they've defined you. To Bob's point, you're always trying to find a way to kind of bring more color in. But this character, the show was about change, radical change in perception and lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. So I got to play the character who more than any other character was suddenly like, my whole life and my whole way of being has to change. And that show was like, you know, preseason, big hit, first episode. Pow! Yeah. Like eight people watched. Like, I I was one of the eight because I watched it for you and you were terrific in it. And I really, I also thought uh, Shy was great in it. It was a terrific cast, a great concept and deserved to be a bigger success. But you were, you did have a great part in it. And I remember you yeah, it was very a well. They 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 aired it after Lost, and they tried to sell it as something it wasn't. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they tried to kind of stress those aspects of it that were kind of like, "Ooh, spooky mystery." It really wasn't really wasn't quite that. So yeah, that's my answer. I don't. Um, the pilots that I got that didn't sell. I I did the pilot of the Man Who Fell to Earth recently oh. rebooted. Um, and the irony is, I I had the part that Kate Mulgrew has in the, in the present show. <laughs> I had in the 80s when I was in it, uh, you know, the guy chasing him. I was uh, FBI. I think she's CIA. Same character, basically. Um, uh, I did a pilot, um, I remember, for NBC that was sort of like 
it was described, I think, as the Jewish wonder years or something like that. I played the father <laughs> in it. And I thought, oh, NBC needs a comedy. They'll probably pick it up. And instead, they picked up this thing with, you know, I don't, you know, this thing called Friends, which didn't sound very interesting. <laughs> you know, um, so, of course, uh, but but ours was really not very good. So I understood the moment Friends came on why they didn't pick us up. I would say the answer to your question really is a, the Broadway show that never happened. I've always wanted to be in a musical on Broadway. I've done musicals elsewhere in California and, and in regional. Uh, but this was a musical that was to be based on uh, the book Rocket Boys, which became the movie October Sky. Oh, yeah. I would have played the journalist who made the local Rocket Boys famous. And there was a great 11 o'clock number called Elevate. I, I did two... Uh, auditions for um, backers in New York. I loved playing this part. I loved the script. And then right when they were trying to produce it, um, Universal said, wait a minute, we own the rights to your book, Mr. Oh, Hickam. No. Homer Hickam. In other words, he thought they just owned the movie rights to the, their adaptation, October Sky, and he still owned Rocket Boys, but they said, we bought your book. We have a competing musical. They went against each other legally and neither their show got produced uh, once at I, in San Diego at the Globe, but neither went to Broadway. And I never got my, you know, my Broadway debut singing in that role. So that was the biggest. I really wish that had happened. This is about eight years ago. So someday I will sing in a Broadway musical. Life is someday. fraught with I, I just got I, I'm on a recurring on a show right now. I have a very relatively small part in a show called Manhunt. Uh, happy to do it happy to go to savannah but it's not a huge part but i got a really nice part in barry and i couldn't do it oh it was, man it oh oh bummer well maybe they'll have you back because that's a great that's a great show yeah i know i know so, and you know. anyway guys i've got to go to work because yeah, i know you do killer of the week on a show i can't you mention. want me to stick around and talk about bob for a while after oh. after we <laughs> <laughs> well, we did quite a bit before we got on, so I think we'll probably all right, okay. all right, You've got right. all that. You've got all the. He's all he's right. banked all the insolence, John. All right. Take... <laughs> all right. Mwah. I love you guys. Well, I love, Again, you, guys. Guys. I love you, Will, but I'm sure I, I would if I got to know you. You, you would. You would. I'm really nice. My you wife loves me. <laughs> he he many loves me, and I love him. And you're we, we're just getting used to you. All right. I understand completely. Bye. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate Bye. you. Bye, Bella. Thanks. Bye. Bye.